told uh, Professor Ren, I'm really, uh, um, I, I really enjoyed reading the book. So, um, as someone who is not a historian of science, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really thrilled to actually engage with this material. But the initial reason why I speak today is a conversation that I have with Pat Vagraya, yes, <laughs> who recommended the book to me. And then I had a first look at the book, and I did a word search. And I searched for the word ignorance, that which negates the authority of knowledge, directly or indirectly, actively or passively. And I thought a book about the evolution of knowledge in the Anthropocene certainly has something to say about ignorance. Also because the history of knowledge is shaped by and through epistemological crises that are presently captured in terms like post-truth society, science denialism, and conspiracy theories. The book does not say nothing about <laughs> ignorance, but in different ways and in different terms. So the word ignorance actually only shows up twice in the entire book. Once in one of the beautiful epigraphs, in which they're really beautiful, <laughs> in which ignorance is part of a list of negative attributes like vanity, short-sightedness, and biases in general. So there's like nothing. Ignorance is nothing significant. And the second time it shows up in the written text on page 10, where Ren questions the idea that science is neutral. Science comes with responsibility, as we already heard and it can be abused. Lin then asks whether such an abuse might be an expression of ignorance and advocates for a broader concept of knowledge, but never really returns, or not really, but never returns <laughs> to ignorance. <coughs> While the book provides us with an intricate understanding of knowledge that allows for the analyses of interdependent networks of knowledge economies, entanglements between science, knowledge, and society, and long-term processes, rather than only singular events, evolution rather than revolution, as we already heard, it never actually talks about ignorance and the role of ignorance in the evolution of knowledge. But don't we experience, I ask myself, an a in the Anthropocene, an age that is centered around the human uh, species, its needs and desires, how everything we do in the present and future is shaped by the question, how we respond to the structural, political, and personal ignorance of the very natural basis of our survival. Any centrism, like Eurocentrism, <laughs> indicates there is something left out or excluded, which plays a fundamental role for what emerges, which implies that there is something deeply wrong in the way knowledge is produced, or has been produced in the past. In the context of the Anthropocene, it means that there are blind spots that are intrinsic to the system and allow for the reproduction of industrialist and capitalist knowledge economies that use knowledge to exploit resources. I understand Ren's book as an encouragement to leave the center's view and picture us within the interdependencies we ourselves form part of. Ren also compares the history of knowledge to the layered strata of geological formation. But I find that beautiful metaphor. And that constitutes the very ground on which we move. But given a global pandemic, a climate meltdown, and ongoing devastation through wars, knowledge itself has become politicized and political. On the one hand, we have those who deny the consensus of academic science. Here, at least to my knowledge, the book does not discuss the increasingly strong social movement in Europe and North America um, of so-called science deniers. And which I would consider an arguably significant phenomenon of our anthropocentric age. On the other hand, um, there are those who put bumper stickers on their car that read, I believe in science which is itself an ironic reminder that science is often not about objectivity, but objectivity itself is a faith or political goal. The Enlightenment Project is a project of conviction, or uh, of which Gadamer famously said that its most fundamental prejudice was the prejudice against prejudice itself. 
So given this political understanding of knowledge, which Han acknowledges and warns of, and the centrist dynamic of the Anthropocene, my question became how his intriguing model of a multi-causal and interdependent, not deterministic or teleological evolution can fulfill what it promises without talking about ignorance. To be fair, he speaks about missing knowledge toward the end of the book, but only in a very short section. And he mentions scholars like Jared Diamond, but interestingly, not as a collapsologist, but as a scientist interested in better knowledge, more complex knowledge, more interdependent knowledge. I read Diamond as someone who stresses the inevitability of collapse. He considers himself to be part of the collapsology movement. Rather than, right, and that's, that's something he always kind of warns of, but kind of that there's, he says that there's, there's no possibility anymore to fix the problem, the problem we're facing through science, through the kind of knowledge production we're used to. According to cosmologists, we need to learn to exist in conditions of uncertainty and stop trying to master the contingency of reality. In this sense, he could be put in the tradition of Socrates, Cusanos, and Kierkegaard, who considered it the wisest, most prudent, and meaningful thing to cultivate a sense of learned ignorance, of knowing not to know, and understanding the limits of knowledge as essential for knowledge itself. But to say with Socrates, I know one thing that I know nothing, is only one dimension or side of ignorance, I would argue. There are many, and we would need to discuss, also on a normative level, which part of ignorance we like, we want, we agree with, and which part we disagree with, we do not like. Yet in any case, it seems uncontroversial to say that ignorance matters. It expresses the force of the negative, the indirect, unspoken, un unfathomable in history. So in light of this, my question became then how a multi-causal and independent, not deterministic or teleological model of evolution could maybe also allow for and integrate this force of the negative. A model that could integrate that knowledge which failed or which we forget. So those stages in the past that are essential but no longer hold. Layers that kind of desediment, so to say, right? For also that knowledge which we suppress or marginalize or kill, which could be described as willful ignorance, right? Has been thematized by Charles Mills, for instance, in, uh, in, in, in this term white ignorance, or even Hannah Arendt. Hannah Arendt's, uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, term thought business in um, Eichmann in Jerusalem. It's a specific form of evil there. Or can it kind of integrate knowledge which is there only indirectly, but determines us nevertheless? I speak here of existential and effective states like death, struggle, contingency, but also love and freedom some of which is often grasped in aesthetics, art, religion, and mysticism. And Renz's book alludes to that every now and then. So in trying to trace these dimensions of ignorance in the book, the epistemological, political, and existential, and in trying to figure out ways in which they can form a part of the overall project, I realized that there are specific assumptions central to the book's approach to knowledge which might make that difficult for us. And here I offer three points. First, and I already alluded to that in my last question, or the, my first and last, <laughs> so far. Um, even if Marx is quoted quite often and made use of in understanding knowledge in terms of capital, exchange, and use value, Hegel's philosophy of knowledge seems to be a more suitable model to describe the book's general view. I find particularly Hegelian the depiction of knowledge as a source that grows, becomes ever more complex, differentiated in the process, and integrated. Secondly, there is a certain hermeneutics 
that looks back from a distance and describes developments retrospectively, like Minerva, <laughs> who only flies at dusk. So the metaphor of sedimentation is a case in point here, I would argue. We hear about how knowledge emerges on the basis of previous layers. It transitions, changes through learning processes. While less teleological than Hegel, for sure, the basic narrative stays the same. Different knowledge economies are integrated through mediation and new forms of synthesis. Just as an example, listen to the trajectory from biological to cultural to epistemic evolution on page 326, quote. Just as cultural evolution was grounded in biological evolution, so this new form of evolution, epistemic evolution, is grounded in cultural evolution. With each new evolutionary process in this cascade, the preceding ones eventually becomes to some extent dependent on the following layers. Thus, the continued existence of our spe species, in a biological sense, became dependent on cultural evolution once the latter had reached a global level. And with the globalization of an economy dependent on science and technology, the survival of human culture as we know it becomes dependent on epistemic evolution. While I think there are many advantages of this kind of methodological approach, right, it allows them to integrate genealogy and systems uh, analysis, it becomes more, well, yes, it becomes more and more difficult to envision a standpoint of critique, a standpoint that's outside the system, or questions and uproots the system, or will provoke a paradigm shift in the future. In this sense, one can say, that the Anthropocene is the result of what we came to know without offering much of an alternative or critical perspective. Granted, this is also difficult. <laughs> but the position, the position of analysis follows that which has emerged, grew more differentiated, synthesized, and integrated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This leads to my second point, the question of critique and the political. Even though Ren states clearly that knowledge is political and warns against the depoliticization of knowledge, the language he uses is strangely detached from any form of Marxist struggle of the oppressed against domination. He depicts political developments from a distance, does not see his own position as a result of those political struggles. So he may, we mainly look here at the knowledge which became the norm, however tumultuously, <laughs> um, or through learning processes, and we don't look at that which failed in the dynamics of history, and still matters. And here uh, I cannot but discuss the example of the axial age that, that you gave on pages 201 and following because it touches on my own research. It's only one small example, <laughs> but I think illuminating. So you appreciate and criticize the concept, right? So the paradigm says there was an evolution around uh, 500 BCE in significant cultural centers across the world. In Elkanah's words, some of us know. <laughs> um, people were able to step back and look beyond because it's like a new sense of transcendence. Um, they transition from they transition from a cosmological world to of myth to a self-reflective world of logos, and this then contributed to the globalization that then uh, then considers the basis of our current knowledge knowledge economies. Now, then rightly criticizes uh, with Asman that major cultures, specifically oral cultures, were left out of ignorance that the temporal limitation to 500, around 500 BCE is overdrawn, and that Jaspers, the originator of the paradigm, projects too much of his own existentialist ideology onto the shift from mythos to logos. All, I think, correct points of critique. But what this perspective does not see is that Jaspers never speaks about the realization of the axial age in history. He speaks about the failure of the age. And he does not think that there was a shift from mythos to logos, but he thinks that there was a break with cosmological ignorance led to the possibility of learned ignorance, meaning 
now myth becomes self-reflective. So against the legacy, and the legacy, yes, the legacy kind of establishes that dichotomy. Bella, Eisenstadt, Habermas, Asman. Um, against the legacy which insists that the idea of the actual age represents an irrevocable break with myth, Jaspers argued that the time was, quote, myth creating after a new fashion, at the very moment when the structure of myth as a whole is destroyed. I wonder why this intervention into the myth debate, that's how I interpret Jaspers' book, has been ignored so far. Is there something about the concept of myth that makes it become contested and excluded? So the concept of the exclusion of myth is my third and last point. <laughs> Even though Ben's approach allows for much nuance and perspectivality, and criticizes a certain reading of the positivist view, according to which science is primarily interested in the establishment of facts and certainty, he does not integrate ignorance by way of myth. To be sure, Rand certainly acknowledges the importance of myth for the emergence of knowledge economies. But myth as a form of knowledge that has a claim on truth does not enter into his discourse. Viewed from a contemporary perspective, Myth is something illusory, and maybe even wrong. In this sense, Ben's position is itself political. It derives from a 20th century consensus that connects legal positivists like Popper, Carnap, and Weber with philosophers of myth like Sierra and Malinowski, and also central parts of the Frankfurt School, Dorno, Horkheim, and Habermas, who all view myth as ambiguous. On the one hand, it deeply moves us, but we can never actually talk about it. On the other hand, it's illusory, it's pathological, and needs to be excised as society becomes more rational and more free. In today's era of disinformation and polarization, this myth-skeptical consensus um, remains dominant. And I think we can see that in your book. I do not think that Ben falls prey to this dichotomy in, in its entirety. Um, he probably would agree with Blumenberg's anthropological perspective, which sees in myth uh, the human reaction to absolute reality, or rel reality's absoluteness, without which, given our own vulnerability, we, could, we would not be able to survive. But he does not give us an idea of myth um, and how it is, as I have said, an element of science, right? Maybe a constitutive element of science and how we can work on myth and potentially even distinguish good from bad myth. I would argue that myth as an analytic and also force of truth has to be taken seriously next to the role of science and politics in history if we want to say that facts do not have a superior access to truth. Question, what is there in science after positivism? Okay. Taking these three points together, the book's philosophy of science, its own political position and agenda, and its limited possibility to, um, to integrate and evaluate uh, knowledge claims that are myth-based, the, the overall question my comments boil down to is, how would a science look like which actively acknowledges the role of ignorance? Robert Proctor and others have coined a term for the study of ignorance, agnotology, which Anne does not mention in his book. I would like to end my presentation with a quote from one of its advocates, the biologist Stuart Feierstein. In his book, Ignorance, How It Drives Science, he tries to make use of how the poet John Keats captures learned ignorance as negative capability. And here's the quote. Science, then, is not like the onion in the often used analogy of stripping away layer after layer to get at some core central fundamental truth. Rather, it's like the magic well. No matter how many buckets of water you remove, there's always another one to be had. Another metaphor. <laughs> to, 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 to the many metaphors that you actually have in your book, my favorite one is science as a golem, I have to say. <laughs> so, following the uh, uh, last, uh, the second part, instead of a system where the collection of facts is an end, where knowledge is equated with accumulation, where ignorance is rarely discussed, we will have to provide the wiki raised student with a taste of and for boundaries. 
of how the data, which are not unimportant, frames the unknown. Thank you.